hey, it's me, your financial advisor. Look, I know you've got to get your portfolios in order, and maybe you want to figure out if you want to get in on Bitcoin if you think it's going to surge again. But you know what's for sure a good financial decision? It's listening to this podcast because it costs zero dollars. Hooray! Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, I hinted at this last week, but we will be doing a Potterless fundraiser coming up soon. We will have details for it next week. So get ready. I'll say it in the intro of next episode. I'll post it on social media and stuff like that. But the gears are turning and I'm excited to make this happen. Also, I just want to lay out the groundwork for what this episode is. This is a standalone episode that Eric Silver worked on the research for. It was for an article that he is writing that will be released online. Depending on when you're listening to this, it might already be out there. If it is out there, it'll be a link in this episode. If not, here's a preview, I guess. But basically, Eric did a bunch of research into anti-Semitism in fantasy as a whole, but then also is able to relate that to Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Dungeons and Dragons, and more. So this episode starts with a comedic story that Eric makes me tell everyone that has nothing to do with anything that we're about to talk about. It's from my childhood. Then Eric will talk about Harry Potter-based anti-Semitism stuff, and then there will be a discussion of Lord of the Rings and other fantasy beyond Harry Potter. But it's solid work from Eric. It's an important discussion to have, and I think it's a nice discussion to have before we end up covering a bunch of J.K. Rowling-based stuff in the Fantastic Beasts movies, I thought it was nice to have a bit of a more J.K. critical episode. So I hope you all enjoy this, and I'm excited to present this episode for you. But before we do, let's thank the newest members of our team over at patreon.com slash Potterless who are supporting the show. So shout out to Kathleen Bissett, Katie Nudson, and Micromama47, also a name correction for Lavender Jones. And of course, as always, a huge shout out to our producer-level patrons, Vicky, Christine, Aaron, Clown, Martismo, Juan, Rosemary, Marie, Lisa, Audra, Eleanor, Nikita, Rachel, Zachary, Alex, John, Noel, Claire, Rory, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Justin, Jacob, Maya, Mark, Polly, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Kafir, Sarah, Marta, Maya, Floor, Georgia, Skyla, Adele, Professor, Threat, Ellie, Michael, Kelly, Kerry, Connie, Jen, Nedry, Will, Marcos, Marik, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, the Meadows family, Ginny, Heather, Kevin, Jarl, Peter, Jan, and Callahan, Leah, Bella, Melanie, Becca, Reese, Adam, Joseph, Lily's mom, Madison, Tonk, Sabrina, Sophia, Farzan, Melanie, Matt, Okamahime, Boney Pony, Kelsey, Rike, Taylor, Megan, Riley, Laurel, Erica, Miranda, Landon, Kendra, Natanya, Yogan, Darcy, Sandra, Craig, Lior, Demi, Michelle, Callista, Jennifer, Henrique, Delkis, Katrina, Casey, Megan, Zat, Jack, Sophia, Dane, Robin, Chick, Mermaid, Dedekins, Alaria, Gregory, Stan, Kaka, Nina, Ribbon, Brittany, Ashley, Gavin, Jack, Serenity, Emily, Haley, Sabrina, Jenna, Laura, Gila, Eileen, Annette, Kirsten, Hufflepuff, Brett, Hunter, Mary, Artemis, Trans People, or People, Samantha, Nina, Tatiana, Taylor, Karis, Vomit Spiders, Tony, Joe, Punkfish, Rochelle, Wire Warrior, Catherine, Joe, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never use a particular knife while cooking, then put it in the sink thinking, I don't need to use this knife again, and then when they go to cut the next thing, they realize, I need that knife! If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, director's commentary, exclusive live streams, the patron-only Discord, and more, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 161 of Potterless, a look at anti-Semitism in Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and fantasy with Eric Silver. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 28-year-old man who never read the Harry Potter series as a kid. He read them as an adult, and now he is going above and beyond just covering books and stuff, even above and beyond covering spinoff media. We have a very special guest lecturer here today, uh, another Fred talk in the repertoire of Potterless stuff. We have a fan favorite guest, longtime multitude co-collaborator Eric Silver is back, and he's here for a very important discussion but first, Eric, how's it going? Good. I'm very happy to be here. This was like a little bit of a journalist moment for me. <laughs> I wrote something and then I'm like, I can talk about that a little bit on a podcast. <laughs> so like, I kind of work at the Huffington Post now. I don't know if you knew. Is the Huffington Post, I feel like every place is releasing bad opinion pieces. Are they on that list too? I know the Washington Post is there where they're like, actually, people that did bad stuff, let's let them get away with everything. I'm sure. Here's my opinion. I can't keep track of all the places putting out terrible. <laughs> Terrible takes, but instead I'm going to take on one terrible take is that people don't think that the goblins in Harry Potter are anti-Semitic. Yes, this is good. I'm excited because 
basically every time you've been on the podcast, this comes up. Yeah. And I think it's an important discussion to have. And I think it's an incredibly important discussion to devote an entire episode to, especially before what we get to covering next in Potterless, which is the Fantastic Beasts movies, which are, I think, the final thing that like J.K. Rowling had a hand in that I will ever be covering on the podcast or caring about in my life. So I'm excited to have this as like a primer to covering J.K. stuff again, because I was in the nice bliss of talking about puffs for like 10 episodes, which was wonderful <laughs> and beautiful. And now before we get back into it, I think it's nice to be like, hey, before we do some JK stuff, here's some problematic JK stuff. My name's Eric Silver, and I've experienced with this. Listen. So here we are. That was a great impression of me. I don't know how you nailed it. <laughs> um, you have to laugh at the end after I say something uncomfortable like that. But yes, you know, every time I came on here, at first it was funny that we were talking about Wizard Christmas, and then I've been thinking about it a lot since then, and it kept coming up. And I think that people think that this is like my opinion. But So I wanted to do some deep diving on the actual text, looking at both like the Anthony Goldstein communication and then deconstructing some fantasy stuff. We talked about this the last time I was on here, but Harry Potter is a derivative of the fantasy genre. And this has been going on in fantasy for a very long time. So we're going to talk about like fantasy tropes, take a stop off in uh, Lord of the Rings and then come all the way back to Harry Potter. I kind of have an act structure here. Uh, so imagine this is a play I'm putting on about <laughs> anti-Semitism and Harry Potter. But first, we do need to warm up the crowd and I'm going to be speaking a lot. So Mike, I wanted you to tell a story that I found out about at the multitude winter like <laughs> mix around that we did over Zoom about the time that you won a trophy for involving the song Gossip Folks by Missy Elliott. So yes, I won a regional gold medal for this particular hip hop dance that I was in, in fifth grade. I won multiple gold medals, but the most fun medal that we won, and the reason this came up in Two Truths and a Lie, is one of the regional gold medals that I won was at a dance competition called Teen Miss Dance of New Jersey. <laughs> now, I was not awarded Teen Miss Dance of New Jersey, but this was the name of the big tournament that took place. There were a lot of other entries in it. So basically, I started taking hip hop dance classes in fourth grade. My sister was very big into dance. She ended up minoring in dance in college. And the dance company that she was a part of, Stuart Johnson Dance Academy in Hamilton Township, New Jersey, they started to open up an all boys hip hop class to try to bring in, you know, the brothers of all the girls that were doing the dancing. So I started doing that in fourth grade, did it again in fifth grade, and then I was pretty good at it, good enough to where <laughs> they took me and two other boys and put us into a trio. And being in a trio was a big deal, or just being in any sort of non-group dance was a big deal, whether it was a solo or a duo or a trio. You would get different performances, and it was like this big status thing. This created drama that I was unaware about until <laughs> like I heard dancer moms talking shit about me behind my back, because Damn. their daughters, who have been in the program for years, are more talented, and these boys only got a trio because they're boys. And like, yes, that's probably true, but we were also good. And like, uh, what's so bad about, you know, having some diversity in the mix? Like, I know this is a, a being like, oh my gosh, boys yeah, getting diversity. Why are there more men involved? <laughs> but still like, yes, we only got it because we were different, but we were also good. And most importantly, we had a very solid hip hop routine that we did to Gossip Folks by Missy Elliott. We wore the whole Adidas tracksuit over school uniform look that they had from the music video. The routine was fantastic. I need to try to obtain video of it because I know there is a video recording of it. It's just like on my friend's mom's VHS tapes. So I have to like have weird conversations with people I haven't talked to in years. But yeah, I mean, it was objectively a good dance and we won a bunch of gold medals and I still have the regional trophy from Teen Miss Dance New Jersey from 2003 in my bedroom at Barb and Joel's place in Texas. Incredible. I do like the idea of you having to call these people up and be like, hey, uh, Mrs. Johnson, hi, this is Michael <laughs> Schubert, remember, from Teen Miss Dance? Uh, I have a really popular show now, and I would really love it if I could rip that VHS. I mean, honestly, what it has to be is me messaging Dana Krell and being like, hi, Dana Krell, I know that your mom definitely bought all of the VHS tapes of the recitals. Uh, can you go through the effort of digitizing a VHS? I mean, now that I'm 
in New York, I could offer, hey, is it okay if I take a train into New Jersey and go to your mom's place? No, still bonkers. That's even more wild, Mike. I, I mean, I don't want to be like, tell your mom to go to a place that digitizes VHSs so that your mother can now make a video. You know, I should reach out to just the dance company. Maybe they've already digitized it. Or at least it would be a less big ask to be like, hey, if you guys haven't done this already, you probably should. All of these things you're suggesting are all wild. And whatever <laughs> happens, please let me know. I need the video of it because I want to see what it looks like. Oh, I I'm need, sure I just does. I remember it being perfect, but I hope it's as good as my memory serves. I'm totally sure that it is. I do remember explicitly that we had to dance to the clean version of it. Sure. And I remember one time our teacher, Christina Dueling offhandedly mentioned not knowing what the lyrics meant at this point. And this is when like lyrics websites had just come out in the year 2003. And I was like, oh, there's this lyric website that tells you about like what the lyrics mean. Do you want me to look it up? And she was like, no, don't do <laughs> you're <that>. 11. <laughs> Get off the internet, tiny Michael Schubert. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, this was like in a Shakespeare play where it's like, we're going to talk about the history of, of Henry VIII. But first, someone's going to tell some dick jokes. <laughs> this is what this was. It's like the play within a play in Midsummer Night's Dream. I did play the wall in Midsummer Night's Dream in Rice University's production of it. You can also see that on YouTube. If you search Rice University Midsummer Night's Dream, check out your boy. I'm at like the one hour and change mark is my beautiful wall monologue. Classic. All right, here we go. Um, so let's get into anti-Semitism and Harry Potter mm -hmm. as we all envision Mike as a wall. Wonderful. Okay, here is act one. Let's talk about the tweets that led to Anthony Goldstein. J.K. Rowling did not offer that there was a Jewish wizard from the jump during her peak, I'm going to tweet diversity back into my book. This was right around the time that Dumbledore supposedly was gay that backfilled into the book. So she was doing a Q&A online. Ben Rothman tweeted at J.K. Rowling. See if there's a red flag in this question. Okay. My wife said there are no Jews at Hogwarts. I'm a Jew, so I assume she said it to be the only one who's magical in the family. Thoughts? Uh... Ben, is your wife a Nazi? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Ben, is your Christian wife trying to say that no Jews exist so that she can be the only wizard in the family? That is wild stuff. <laughs> Feels like an unhealthy relationship between Ben and his wife if they're trying to one-up each other in ways that objectively are not as important. <laughs> nope, nope. It's like, hey, Ben, I'm your wife. I accept you and your religion and your ethnicity but also, uh, no Jews at Hogwarts, fuck ya. To establish yourself as the only wizard in the relationship is like the worst version of those t-shirts that say, I haven't gone to Hogwarts yet, I'm just waiting on my acceptance letter, or one of those things, like my acceptance letter is just running late. It's the extreme worst version of that. I need, once uh, <laughs> once the wizarding world opens up again, I need someone to have a t-shirt that says, um, <laughs> I'm the only religion that is at Hogwarts. Sorry, my Jewish husband. It's like we talked about in a previous episode that you are on the couple's t-shirts when you go to Harry Potter world, you get one that says I'm Jewish and then your wife gets one that says I'm Christian and therefore I'm the only wizard in this relationship. Exactly. My husband can eat shit. I'm a wizard and I'll get one that says I'm a goblin. <laughs> Lol. Oh. Also, this was very terse. J.K. Rowling's response was Anthony Goldstein, comma, Ravenclaw, comma, Jewish wizard, period. That is the tweet. Very terse, J.K. Rowling. You're the one who did a QA and a on Twitter. So, <laughs> okay. It seems like it's structured in a way where she thinks that this is a great own. Like, oh, you nincompoop. I've had one Jewish person. <laughs> it's like they've been there the entire time. And I, I looked into it and like Anthony Goldstein is in the books. Like he's part of Dumbledore's army. He shows up in various times. Like he agrees with something Hermione says at one point. So like J.K. Rowling thinks this is a world building burn. Yeah, you're totally right. Like actually he was there the whole time. You idiot. You fucking dunce. <laughs> right. But it completely leverages itself on everyone reading oh this kid's last name is goldstein he has to be jewish exactly because that's how yes. the world works exactly and she never explicitly said like and then anthony goldstein lit a hanukkah menorah during christmas like she didn't do that and that honestly would have been all of the representation you really need just to prove that there are some jewish wizards is when they're doing all the wizard christmas stuff it's like anthony goldstein explained what a dreidel was yeah it's not great still because she's doing the thing where it's like i have one minority cho chang mm -hmm. anthony goldstein the back Phil of Dumbledore, like I have one diversity person, which is not great. But then she follows up by saying to everyone asking whether their religion slash belief slash non belief system, okay, <laughs> all right, JK Rowling, is represented at Hogwarts. The only person I never imagined there are Wiccans. 
okay, like you, that was weird. That was a weird thing to say. Like, I guess you, you'd think that Wiccans don't exist because magic really exists, but like that is a religion. And so you're dunking on them for no reason. Again, she like, this is very much a thing that we've realized, obviously because of her turfiness, is that her view of the world has to be the only one and it has to exist. She doesn't examine it at all. And it's like, oh, it's there. I'm just not going to color it in. And like, I only care about like the Christians and these white people and these people who I've created in my books. Yeah. What's strange is that her response is not matching what most people have told me in response to you and I having this conversation is people say, oh, you're looking too much into them calling the Christmas holiday, Christmas holiday, Easter holiday, Easter holiday. It's just a very UK thing to name the holiday breaks after the religious holidays. It doesn't necessarily mean it's religious. It's weird that J.K. Rowling didn't even bring that up because that's the most common critique I've heard when you've brought this up on the show before. Yeah. And I just want to respond to that. Like, hey, you could just not do that. And this is part of something that I thought that originally when I went into this research, I thought that J.K. Rowling was doing was that she doesn't examine the world around her. Remember how you didn't know that Hogwarts was actually just based off of private schools in the UK? Mm -hmm. So it's like that. It's like, hey, this is a fantasy book. You could have taken all of this and like taken out the house system. You could have made this inclusive for everyone. Religion, it's weird that Jesus and magic exists at the same time. Do you need to examine that in your world building? Oh, no, you're not going to. Okay, I guess that's a choice. Like, this is a choice she is making as an author that the world around her is, in the way that she views it, is the world. It's her responsibility to look at the world around her and examine it. She obviously doesn't want to. Things get a little weirder as you start looking a little bit deeper past Anthony Goldstein and looking at the goblins. Um, one last thing I want to say about Anthony Goldstein. It's really strange that in the games and like in the visualizations, he's blonde, hmm. which I always thought was weird. Like my dad that. is a, is blonde and Jewish and Jews can look anyway. They don't just need to look one way. All the Jews don't need to look like me <laughs> to go in there. But at the same time, if you're going to go off of the fact that Anthony Goldstein is Jewish just because of his last name and then you make him blonde, that's just a weird choice, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't I don't know. I didn't I didn't love that. It it just makes it more and more strange that she didn't bring it up. Yeah. And it's upsetting that she couldn't have even put the the tiniest thing. I get that people will say this was written in a time when diversity wasn't as big of a deal, blah, blah, blah. Like it wasn't something writers were as conscious of. But just because something was written back then does not mean we can't be critical of it. Like the whole holding things to different standards argument, I've never really bought. Because the whole point of having these discussions is to hope that we make things better going forward. Right. So to say that something written in 1990, whatever, or 2000, whatever, doesn't hold up, I don't think that that is a problem or a flawed discussion to have. I think it's still important. Like, J.K. Rowling's not dead. She could have written more things and made you like, ah, I'm going to re-examine my old stuff. But of course, she's a terrible person and she's not going to. And she also could have written something on Pottermore that apologized for a lack of diversity. Or brought up the point, like, that there could have been more explicitly diverse characters in the books. But she has only ever apologized for time travel. <laughs> good. Good thing to apologize for. Uh, <laughs> I think it's interesting to talk about how Harry Potter is steeped in the fantasy genre. Because people kind of gloss over that. They're like, ah, it's real London, but then also magic. So this is an offshoot of fantasy. And this is something I care about quite deeply. Because also in the last episode that we talked about, I have to wrestle a lot with this in Dungeons and Dragons as I DM uh, join the party. Yeah, because Wizards of the Coast, they have some problems that I've firsthand now experienced because over Christmas where we were up with our family in Canada, I was playing a lot of Betrayal at the House on the Hill, yeah. which is made by Wizards of the Coast. And there's one of the haunts is wildly, I don't know if sexist is the term, but there's one that involves like the ghost bride. And if the character that's the haunt person is not a female to go with the male ghost. Like the rules have six bullet points about how to make sure that this marriage is between a man and a woman. And it's so unnecessary for a game made in 2010. It's really, it's really, really odd. Again, they don't examine the world around them. They're just like, oh, gender roles, ghost bride. I guess we're going to explicitly put it in our game and we can't change it. Yeah. And it's very heavy on he or she and very heavy. It's not, there's multiple haunts where if the the genders don't line up. You're supposed to introduce a new character mm -hmm. in to make the genders lined up. And it's like, just let a lady marry the ghost bride. It's not a big deal. Let a dude marry the zombie husband. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Fantasy, the genre seems 
immutable, which is just 100% not true. It's just a genre. So I really want to go into what do we mean when we mean discrimination in fantasy. Fantasy usually uses the metaphor of bigotry and discrimination because it's easier to deal with the representation. Like think about like humans versus orcs or in, in all of these because it's not like uh, hey, all the humans have now figured their shit out because they're fighting monsters. And that seems so much easier to deal with. Uh, here's a great quote from Terry Pratchett, who wrote the Discworld series, which is very much a skewering of uh, of the fantasy genre. Racism was not a problem on the Discworld because, what well, with all the trolls and dwarfs and so on, speciesism was more interesting. Black and white lived in perfect harmony and ganged up on green. But of course, that's dangerous to think about. Terry Ratchett is very aware of what this is. Discworld, again, is very much like a deconstruction of the fantasy genre. But like when you don't examine it like that, you think it's fine. It's like, ah, fuck, like uh, humans versus elves or elves versus dwarves in this way. There's a really good way to examine this that I got from an expansion of the tabletop RPG game Kids on Bikes uh, when you want to introduce like a fantasy race into this game. It'll be a good time to decide whether your game features fantasy oppression, such as racism against fae, or legal restrictions on magic. These forms of oppression may seem safer to work with than real-life power dynamics, but sometimes it's even riskier. Precisely because they feel safer, they can encourage individuals to exaggerate prejudice behavior. Players who like pretending they're marginalized people enjoy the illusion of challenge and adversity on a temporary low-stakes basis. Fantasy can be a fun, safe, safe place to explore some of these concepts, but keep the safety measures in mind in case they get exploitative. So, especially when you're playing a tabletop RPG, you can be like, I'm going to be a goblin, or I'm going to be an elf, and you guys hate me, and then I get to be, like, wear this oppressed suit for a while, which is messed up in its own way. Um, it, like, gives permission to the high a socioeconomic group that like it's fine and you can explain it away with because it's just fantasy because it's not remember people wrote this and bring their own prejudices into this into this world and into fantasy yeah i'm interested to see where you go with this because thinking about it i feel like this is one of the things jake Rowling did an okay job with because there's multiple points in the series where wizards are shown to be elitist and then there's a form of hubris that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. And then also the whole Death Eater thing is supposed to be a racial allegory. Right. So I'm intrigued to see how she could miss the mark with things like the goblins, but then also do a good job of commentary in other areas? I think it's that thought and something that was coming up a lot during the Georgia Senate elections was like, wow, the South is so racist. So glad they're getting over our ra their racism. Us in the North are not racist. Wow, I cannot believe the South. It's like, dog, that's just super not true. Like, there's racism everywhere. It's baked into our institutions. Discrimination of, of all, in so many ways, are still baked into it. I think that she's coming from this, in this neoliberal idea, which is also where a lot of that turfism comes from, is like, no, we're totally accepting of all gay and lesbian folk. Just don't be trans. Hate that. Yeah. That's when we're looking at it. We have fake Nazis who hate blood mixing, which is like the worst possible thing. You can be like, I hate Nazis, but also I probably won't hire a black person. Or I hate Nazis, but like, you better say Merry Christmas and things like that. So I think that she's in, she's trying to engage with uh, this conflict, the discrimination conflict of magic and non-magic. And then it comes from both sides, how like muggles are afraid of wizards, but wizards can say epithets to muggles and like care enough about being born from a non-magical family that you can call someone a mudblood. Like, in you know, both sides, there, there's this conflict, and then the, the Death Eaters take it too far. When it's wizard on wizard, the humans who are engaging with it, but the beasts in there are something that she doesn't engage with because I think she glosses over it because she only cares about humans, which is very messed up to do in a fantasy book where you have, are building this world and you intentionally introduce so many other races. It's pretty messed up. I think that a really interesting way to examine this is this trope called the Space Jew, um, which is where you have a uh, an alien, a monster, an animal, or another non-human creature that embodies stereotypical aspects of a real-world racial 
ethnic or religious stereotype. This isn't just about Jews. That's just what the trope is called. So it could be about Jewish people, black people, Asian people, or whatever. And the trope is played intentionally to demonstrate the otherness as compared to the humans in there. So if you want to use Star Wars as an example, Mike, think about Jar Jar Binks. Yeah, I don't know much about Star Wars, but he did feel like a bad Jamaican allegory. Exactly. It's like, this is an alien. It is not like humans which is like pretty much Luke Skywalker or Han Solo. Um, and he's going to pretty much, he's clumsy, he's silly, he has a really strange speech pattern, but yet he's also a senator because it's like, this is the best that the Gungans, that alien race can do, and he's an a senator, who, who can say? So you can still do that and play on, although George Lucas said he didn't, it's really strange that this is so much like black minstrelsy, that this could be the stereotype and they are the other, they are the alien as compared to the humans in Star Wars. Yeah, I feel like when you have these sorts of character representations, when it's so different that you've made it an entire race, it almost, Mm -hmm. like, it's trying to make it, like, too easy for the audience when people are rude to them. Like, oh, clearly you shouldn't be mean against this other race. Yeah. But then you lose out on discussions about things like privilege where you have, you know, different types of the same race having certain advantages. Like, you, you miss out on some of the like not as obvious like big things that people sometimes fail to recognize kind of like you're saying with the south thing people to this day don't think white privilege is actually a thing yeah and there's not enough discussion about it right it is so much easier to look at the difference between human and alien or human and beast than it is to examine the race in the in which we're dealing with in the real world the idea that one race is better than another race which is blatantly not true also when you assign qualities and strengths and weaknesses to other species like to aliens or to beasts or to other fantasy races, you're say, you're pretty much playing on phrenology, which is the idea that different races differently have different brains mm. and like uh, white people have bigger brains and black people have smaller brains, which is just blatantly not true in some Nazi bullshit. But you're reinforcing that orcs are stronger and bigger, but so much dumber. It's like, you didn't have to you didn't have to make that. You're the one writing this. You didn't have to reinforce that. And it's something that we're still trying to separate um because uh, that's like the basis of fantasy in so many ways. Mm-hmm. I want to make a very important point here. What I'm not saying is the fantasy counterpart culture. So talking about, Harry Potter from Goblet of Fire. What were those two other schools that showed up? It was Durmstrang, the big breakdance boys from Bulgaria, and Beaubaton, the French people. Right. So those were literally like, this is France. And if Hogwarts is England, they are France, and this is Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily what I'm talking about, where you say there is a fantasy counterpart culture. Like, I want you to think about Wakanda when we're talking about this. Like, Wakanda was made to be an African country that withstood colonialism. There's a lot of inspiration from the Mali Empire that they pulled from. Chadwick Boseman really, really pushed for making sure that the accent was correct that he did for Black Panther and for everyone in Wakanda. He wouldn't speak in a British accent. He would speak I I don't remember the city or the country specifically, but it might have been like Zimbabwe or in that general area. Like we needed a Wakandan accent that had to be uh, specifically African. Um, This is also not like, um, you know, in all those Disney movies, how they're like vaguely in a European country. Like, you know how in Frozen, Arendelle is basically Norway. Yeah. Like that's not what we're talking about here. Or like in every Christmas movie that involves someone marrying a prince, they're always from like Andovia or vague Europe. (laughs) Right. So we're not talking about like this. We were inspired, but it is in we're taking some things. This is literal stereotype. Mm -hmm. And the the racial or ethnic essentialism that is baked into that is like this is what they are. This is stereotype. And whether or not it's intentional, it's still there. And I think it's worth pointing out. I think the final thing is to point out what I'm talking about when I mean anti-Semitic representation. You you guys just might not know some things that are devoted to Jews. So <laughs> I think it was I wanted uh, to lay it out. I got this from the Louis D. Brandeis Center from the Human Rights Under Law. Demonization. You might know that lots of people think Jews have horns, have bulging eyes, and are generally like satanic and demonic. So they're tricky and they are, are they're arrogant in their smarts, which is something that you can, if you're a good Christian fella, you can pull over on the devil. 
Uh, there is the wandering Jew stereotype that, of course, Jews have been cast out of their sacred homeland and are constantly searching and are cursed and doomed to constantly wander in misery until they uh, just kind of give it up for the Christians. Of course, the uh, money and criminality, Jews are tricky and they run businesses and they are wealthy and powerful and menacing and they love having all of this money and greediness. They also have a lot of power. So you might know like that the Jews run the media thing. That is also part of that as well that they control like banking and media. And there's just like nothing we can do because the Jews control it. Um, and finally, you know, big old noses and uh skull caps to represent uh, a kippah. So, like, if you see someone with a big nose and a hat, like, take another look at that. <laughs> it's, it, it, even that, just be like, hey, are there, what are some other qualities about you? Um, Mike, did you ever watch the first Star Wars movie, The Phantom Menace, the one with the pod racing? No, but I have played the pod racing game. Oh, okay, no, actually, that's perfect, because, the you know, the guy, the alien that owns Anakin, that's like, you should pod race. Do you, do you remember his name is Watto? Yes. He has like a big old schnoz and he wears a hat uh -oh. and he has big old eyes and he only cares about money and he literally owns Anakin Skywalker as a slave and he's a cheating businessman mm -hmm. and he's a gambler and he speaks English in a weird accent. I did think it was weird when you win the pod racing race. He says, let's go eat gefilte fish. That was, yeah, they shouldn't have put that <laughs> in the game. That was really messed up. Nah. So like, that's also what we're talking about is like, let's, if you look at Watto, it's like, why is this alien like this you could have made a sneaky businessman but then you did other things whether it was intentionally or not intentionally you made a sneaky businessman into a jewish stereotype and now it is in your fantasy book yeah that's exactly what kelly and i were talking about last night when i was telling her what we were planning to do here she was saying the problem with the goblins is not necessarily that you have angry bankers or you have people that have large noses but right. when the angry bankers are the people with large noses that also have their own language like when all of the checks line up in the boxes, that's when you start to have a problem. Right. You can have wizard people that work at the bank, but if they look like Jewish people, that's a problem. Yeah. I think this is something we're, we're going to get into is like a bank is a job. You can just work at a bank. Yeah. <laughs> like if you need, if you need to reinforce that, like your, your banker has a big nose, don't do that. Just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care what your intention is. That is very naive of you to think that that is an okay thing to do. And then when we look at goblins more and more closely, it gets really strange. But I think that before we get into goblins, we really need to talk about act three here, which is this, a lot of this comes from Lord of the Rings and the dwarves in Lord of the Rings. A lot of this comes from Lord of the Rings being the basis of all fantasy. And this was written in 1937. So, like, if we're going to give a pass to anyone, it's going to be J.R.R. Tolkien, who, like, went through World War I, wanted to write a, a story for his children, and then was like, oh, I put some stereotype in this. I need to fix this. So, The Hobbit was published in 1937. The dwarves in The Hobbit were, like, explicitly Jewish people. He even said they were Jewish people. In, 19, in the 1964 BBC interview, he said, the dwarves, of course, are quite obviously... Like, I mean, you wouldn't say that in many ways they remind you of Jews. Their words are Semitic and obviously are constructed to be Semitic. Uh, Tolkien's dwarves, they're stout. They work with jewels. They're, rec they're relegated to a secondary status uh, in the adventure. Like, Bilbo goes with a bunch of dwarves to this, although Bilbo is the hero and then he has all these dwarven escorts. They're also being depossessed of their ancestral homeland by Smaug. Uh, they have such a prowess in war, which was apparently inspired by how the Hebrews kicked ass in the Torah. They are skilled artisans, They and then they continuously use their dwarvish language outside of their homeland. I mean, like, he says it explicitly in The Hobbit. Dwarves are not heroes, but calculating folk with a great idea for the value of money. Some are tricky and, and treacherous and pretty bad lots. Some are not, but are decent enough people if you don't expect too much. Woof. It's literally in there. It's in there. The fact that the good version is if you don't expect too much, that's rough. So does he eventually go on to fix this in later stuff? I've seen the Lord of the Rings movies, but that's the furthest extent of my knowledge. Because Kelly and I also talked about this last night, and she was saying that the dwarves they're highly regarded for what they do. Like yeah. they're, they're expert craftsmen or something. So did he try to fix this with later stuff? Yeah. So remember this was written in 1937. This was pre world war two as world war two went on. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was like, Oh fuck. 
the, they're getting all killed. Uh, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. So his stance has softened into Lord of the Rings, you can see, with Gimli. And, like, this is more because The Hobbit is just about Bilbo going on this adventure. But the Lord of the Rings is literally about a fellowship and all these races coming together. So, like, although dwarves are still Jews, they are still, like, working together with the elves, with the humans, with all of the hobbits to, like, get it together. And then it becomes, like, positive stereotyping, which is not better because Gimli is still is still very stout, very arrogant, super hairy. All dwarves are like that, care a lot about gold. But like he, he softens it in this way that it's like, not better. I really wish dwarves weren't Jews, but at least you're framing them in more of a good light. However, dwarves are still like secondary status. Like Gimli, to, who is the most prominent dwarf, He's not a hero. You would say he's definitely like a secondary character. He's an NPC. And like him and his relationship with um, uh, Orlando Bloom, the elf. Legolas. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's cute. But like there he's not he's not the protagonist in any sort of way, you know. So it's it's still it's not great. I think I also wanted to say J.R.R. Tolkien did grow. In 1938, um, he and his British publisher were in open talks with a Berlin-based publishing house to get a German translation of The Hobbit. 1938, this is when the Nazis were firmly in power. Um, Tolkien told his publisher that he hated Nazi race doctrine as a wholly pernicious and unscientific Good. Thank you for understanding that. <laughs> um, and he also added that he had a ton of Jewish friends and was considering abandoning the idea of a German translation altogether. Again, okay, baseline. Thank you, JR. The uh, publishing house in Germany then sent Tolkien a letter asking for proof of his Aryan descent. Uh, Tolkien was incensed by this request and what gave his publisher fuck? to. Uh, this was literally Nazi Germany, Mike. Like, <laughs> I mean, I like, guess, obviously. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are two letters he wrote, one that he sidestepped the question and the other one where he responded. Uh, but if I'm to understand you are inquiring of whether or not I'm of Jewish origin, I can only reply that I regret that I appear to have no ancestors of that gifted people. And then he like tears down Nazi doctrine and all that, which is like, OK, you learned. I appreciate this. Like you are on the right side of history. Maybe I didn't like this because all of the articles that I was looking up was like, wow, J.R.R. Tolkien clapped back at Nazi Germany with this wild letter. And I think that this might be the way that we look at the idea of clapping back on the internet right now is like he did this to literal Nazis and did the bare minimum by not working with them and sending a letter. So I'm more critical of that, like all those people that collect all the times of like, wow, 20 times people called Donald Trump a Cheeto. Like, oh, you made fun of someone on the internet. Like, great job. Like, that's not doing anything. And the idea of clapping back, changing anything. Like, this isn't on JR on Tolkien. This is more, like, about how we look at this now. It's like, he, he was living and he didn't, like, I don't know what he did, but, like, he sent a letter to a publishing house. Like, bare minimum, you know? Yeah, him versus Nazis and, like, you're saying people criticizing Trump now. That is just like we talked earlier where it's very easy to write the things where you write about how the very big bad oppression is is a bad thing and we shouldn't stand for it. The harder thing to do is to have the conversations about things that aren't as extreme, yeah. little things in our society where certain groups are given preferential treatment over the other, and that's when you start to have awkward conversations with like, hey, person in my family, let's talk about white privilege in this little nuanced thing that you do, not necessarily like, you're not out here saying the N-word, but you're still doing something that has a bit of issue. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And like just focusing on like, I'm not a Nazi, just so you everyone knows. And like whether or not he thought this letter was going to be public, I'm not putting it on him. Right. But it's like bare minimum, guys, like bare minimum to say that he clapped back at a Nazi publisher. Like, yeah, that's not even necessarily a criticism of him, but of the person writing the article that's like, yes, Queen J.R.R. Tolkien exactly. wrote this thing. That You would be surprised at how many articles I found because I'm like, I remember this letter existing and I want to look it up and how many articles from like both from like. 2014 all the way to like last year we had this framing and I'm like so weird guys you're all so weird <laughs> Giving over the top praise for something that is the bare minimum of good does seem so weird, Eric. But you know what's not so weird? Hey, it's me editing, Mike, by the way. You know what's not so weird? This very natural transition into our next segment of the show, which we like to call Wingardium at Ridosa. Mm -hmm. 
Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Function of Beauty. Let's say hypothetically that you're Severus Snape, and your one distinct character trait that everyone makes fun of you for is your greasy hair. If you would like people to stop making fun of you, and then maybe you wouldn't be, oh, I don't know, so grouchy and mean and grudge-holding towards literal children, maybe you could uh, get rid of your greasy hair with Function of Beauty hair care products. Function of Beauty is the world leader in customizable beauty, offering precise formulations for your hair's specific needs. Now, precise formulations is very fun to say, but it's also accurate because whether you have straight, wavy, curly, or coily hair, whatever your hair goals are, whether you want to lengthen it, volumize it, control the oil in it, Snape, Function of Beauty can get the exact hair care products that you need because they have a survey, a quiz that you take online with over 54 trillion possible formulations, and they have over 50,000 real five-star reviews, so you know that they've got a lot of options and a lot of people who are liking these different options. I am one of those people that really likes it. I've got shampoo, body wash, conditioner, and body lotion from Function of Beauty. They're all fantastic. They all smell fantastic. I am very particular about my hair. I really like the way my hair feels. I get a lot of strength in my hair from the Function of Beauty products, but it doesn't weigh it down so much so that it makes it hard for me to style it in the upward voluminous way that I like it. So I really enjoy their stuff. Kelly loves their stuff. My mom loves their stuff. It's good stuff. All you have to do is take a quick but thorough quiz. You tell them about your hairstyle and then you you choose your color or your fragrance, or you can go fragrance or dye free. Subscribers also get access to more exclusive colors and scents, so that's another incentive to be a subscriber. But then Function of Beauty will determine the perfect blend of ingredients, they'll bottle up your formula, and they will deliver it directly to you with fun seasonal stickers and all the instructions you need if you are someone that doesn't really know what to do with a fancier hair care product. So why would you buy something off the shelf just to be disappointed? Never do that ever again. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash potterless, take your quiz, and save 20% on your first order. That applies to their full range of customized hair, skin, and body products, whatever you want to get from them. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash potterless, let them know you heard about it from our show, and you'll get 20% off your first order. So go to functionofbeauty.com slash potterless, get hooked up with some personalized hair slash body care products, and make sure that no one makes fun of you for having oily hair ever again today. And now you'll hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me, others of them won't. The ones that aren't are inserted locally, so if you live internationally, don't be surprised if you hear an ad in your country's native language. Language. And once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of Potterless. All right, let's go to let's go to the final act here uh, about goblins. Now, originally, I titled this "J.K. Rowling does not examine the world around her." What we said in the beginning of this episode is J.K. Rowling thinks that the thing around her is just like this is her worldview, and maybe she wanted to make like oh, there's like a. There's a, a beastly group that um, is a bank. I guess they're banking and they have big ears and whatever. They're goblins like uh, whatever. But I started looking into this and I'm like, hey, did J.K. Rowling do this intentionally? Because like goblins are Jews mm -hmm. like Mike. I've said this before obliquely, but I looked into the actual text and the details and like are goblins Jews. I mean, have you seen them in the movie? Let's <laughs> let's start with their, what they look like. All of the goblins have big noses and big ears, and some of them are hairy, and some of them wear hats. There's also, <laughs> I, I went on, shout out to the Harry Potter wiki, but like there's just one image of a goblin who lost money in the stock market. And it's like, they just put it in for color. It's like, oh, I lost so many galleons on the potions index. And I'm like, that's funny. But also, why is this in here? Like, it's so strange. Got to make a dope Great Depression joke. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Okay. So the first description of goblins comes in chapter five of book one called Diagon Alley. When Harry goes to Diagon Alley with Hagrid, uh, he goes into Gringotts and the first goblin he sees has a swarthy, clever face, a pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. What the fuck? What does a clever face even mean? Like, swarthy? <laughs> swarthy as an adjective is like, oh, you mean juice. Like, you mean Harry. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be straight up honest. I don't know what swarthy means, but when you said it, my brain said, that's racist. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, swarthy means like hairy, but in a bad way. Mm. There's also the word here astute. Like, you would use it to describe Bigfoot or something. Okay. Or like someone who is hairier than most. Not not great when, you, not great when you're talking 
anything about a person. It's bad. It's so bad. This is even before he meets Griphook. Like, this is just some goblin who works at Gringotts. And then Gr- uh, Griphook is described as having a bald head, a pointed nose and nose and pointed ears. I looked on the Harry Potter wiki, which I take as fact. Like, come on, those people are very rigorous. No, the Harry Potter wiki is very legit, and they make sure that all the information is very up to date, and they pull from stuff like, J.K. Rowling pre-Pottermore had an email newsletter that released information. So they, if it's there, I trust it as fact. Yeah. Um, There's also some uh, goblins have dark slanted eyes. Just weird. Just a weird thing to say. They're also categorized under people with black eyes. As most goblins, like Griphook is in there with like Severus Snape and other people who have black eyes. I'm like, weird that there are enough people to categorize that. And some goblins even wear pointed hats was something that in there. I'm like, all right. This, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Pointed hats is at least existent in Harry Potter, except that the kids just, after the second year, you never hear about the hats anymore. (laughs) Yeah, I search for pointed hats, and then the first instance of pointed hats is like the hat that Harry has to buy as a first year. So I'm like, do you mean a wizard or a witch hat, or do you mean something else? For goblins, feels like something else, but that's all I could find on visual. So not great. Maybe, oh, maybe we still have in our head, maybe this is coincidental. But when you start looking into the relationships between human wizards and goblins, I have some questions if they're not (laughs) just juice. I'm intrigued to see what the sound editing software does with the claps, how well they come through. (laughs) Okay. So goblins converse in a language called gobbledygook. Uh, That just, I don't like that. Don't say that about anything. uh, Calling a language gobbledygook is kind of funny in that you've taken a nonsense word in English Mm -hmm. and you've said, look at this cool joke I've made where the goblins speak it. Isn't that funny? But this is, again, about the checking all the boxes thing. When there's a big parallel to Yiddish, that becomes a problem when it's for the short, grumpy banking people. Yeah, exactly. Like, comparing this, let's compare this to the Dwarven language in Lord of the Rings. You can see the parallels there, but the Dwarven language is, like, specifically supposed to be Yiddish. Like, J.R.R. Tolkien said that. But when you call it gobbledygook, you are intentionally branding it as less than and bad. Yeah. Like, that is the opposite side of of that joke is like they have a language that they speak as their own race and like this isn't even like what J.R.R. Tolkien says that like this is the translation of another language and the best I could do to turn it into common like J.K. Rowling says this that this is just what it is you could have called it anything else but you called it gobbledygook just in case listeners aren't familiar can you briefly describe what Yiddish is just not compared to goblin world, but just like in our human society, yes. Yiddish. So Yiddish is a language that is pretty much only, was only spoken by Eastern European, like Germany, East words, only spoken by Jews. It was a combination of ancient Hebrew. Hebrew was not a spoken language until it was revived in Israel, like in 1970 something. Mm-hmm. So it was a combination of ancient Hebrew and and German. The the Jews would call it the blasphemer's German, or it was their German language. Uh, and it was very, like, Jewish-centric. It had all the words you would need to live in a Jewish society. Uh, Yiddish disappeared. Yiddish has uh, taken a hit uh, since World War II, if you could uh, think about that. So, now, But it is still, like, a very explicitly Jew- Jewish language. Like, my grandparents spoke Yiddish. It was like a conversational thing that people did to each other. People still speak Yiddish now, but it was very much like a mid uh, 20th century language that was just for Jews that was uh, eliminated in so many ways. And a lot of Yiddish words, at least for my Northeast American upbringing, have made their way into English language and common vernacular. So there's a lot of terms and phrases out there that you might think like, oh, you know, saying schmeckle, that's fun, but I'm, I'm assuming that <laughs> so, that was Yiddish. I love that you pulled schmeckle. This shows how long you lived in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like think about a lot of things that revolve around robots are actually Yiddish because that came from that Eastern European. Like oh. glitch is a, it is a Yiddish word. Whoa, I had no idea. Yeah. So glitch, um, oive, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can think of more. They'll come. They'll come to me. I'll just throw them at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the Yiddish has been uh, pulled into English in the way that English uh, loves to do. So that's just gobbledygook, right? Let's keep going. Uh, goblins were adept 
metalsmiths, just like the dwarves in Lord of the Rings. They were notable for their silver work. My last name is Silver, so that makes me feel weird. But like, also, you can tell that a lot of uh, a lot of Jews. The reason why it's okay. Let me. This is important for me to say. The reason why it's weird that you that a stereotype that Jews work in banking and in jewels was that. Jews weren't allowed to have traditional jobs because the Christians didn't want those demonic people to have their hands on regular jobs. So they were put to immoral jobs like money lending and to working with money because Christians and we're, let's talk like this is like Middle Ages Christians were saying, especially in Europe, were like, no, money is such a taboo. I don't want to touch it. That's sinful. And the Jews were like, all right, well, I need a job. So I guess I'll work in banking. And then they were prosecuted for and persecuted for controlling the money. And we're like. That was that was just the jobs we had. What do you mean? What are you talking about? So that's the connection there. So goblins uh, inherently in their race are good at working with silver work. They created all of the galleon sickles and nuts, which I think is kind of interesting. Like literally the goblins control the money uh, due to their skills with money and finances. They control the wizarding economy to a large extent. That is straight from the Harry Potter wiki and run Gringotts. Uh, no one knows that there is another bank. It seems like there is only one bank in, wiz- in the UK wizarding wizarding world which also is like a centralizing of power that only the goblins control and gringotts which just feels weird to me yeah i've made fun of harry potter for having just the one this and just the one that mm-hmm. but when you have just the one bank and then you have the goblins running the bank you unfortunately further embolden the jews control the banking thing that's not fun. You're totally right. And just to, to put a like a real pin on goblins never being like as important in both the books and in society as human wizards are. They created the sword of Gryffindor. Mm -hmm. And then there was like the whole conversation about whether goblins should have it or not. And then giving it to the humans like on that like super deep Harry Potter lore is like. Why Why would you then put this race in the center of this controversy, but over to the side? It, it Again, it's like relegating Goblin to plot secondhand status. It's like, you need to go to this race and figure this out, but the human wizards are going to figure it out. And of course, the human wizards are almost all white, Christian, cis, straight, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, this is the part when... This happened in book seven. I felt like it didn't get discussed enough no. to where I understood what angle J.K. Rowling was going for with the criticism here. I didn't know how much this was supposed to be, look how foolish the wizards are for thinking this, or if you're supposed to think, look at the goblins, they're being so selfish. I felt like it wasn't in-depth enough And maybe it's my poor reading comprehension skills, but I felt like this is an interesting thing that could have been done better in the books if she was trying to make a commentary and not just have a bad stereotype in the series. Yeah, it's really interesting you bring that up because there's a lot of like deep goblin lore when you talk about like goblin rebellion and like the continual relationship between humans and goblins like there were a bunch of really bloody goblin rebellions when the goblins were like hey can we have wands will you let us have wands and the human wizards were like no and the goblins were like okay well we're gonna try to get rights now and the human wizards were like stop it (laughs) and like humans have killed goblins over time like this is where i started being like J.K. Rowling did this intentionally because then when she does the thing where she starts backfilling wizard history, it's like there are a lot of parallels to like goblins being second class citizens, much like other ethnicities, most like Jews, because we're talking about Europe. The thing about the sword of Gryffindor was that goblins do not view commerce as changing ownership. They believe that the people who made it own it forever on some sort of base level. So like, again, we're talking about crafty business practices and ownership and stubbornness and their own kind of skill and creation. So that was the whole problem was that the goblins thought they owned the sort of Gryffindor. And then the humans were like, no, we bought it. And the humans, because we're seeing this from a human wizard perspective, the humans are right and the goblins are silly Mm. in that way. Okay. And then it becomes, oh, look at the goblins trying to screw people out of stuff. Exactly. Those crafty goblins. Let's talk about goblins screwing over humans. Like, let's talk about how goblins interact with Death Eaters in this way. Uh, Because Death Eaters are Nazis, Death Eaters also hate goblins. At one point, Travers says, gold, filthy gold. We cannot live without it. Yes, I confess. I deplore the necessity of consorting with our long-fingered friends. So this is kind of what I just said is like 
Death Eaters, because they are like straight up crusaders and Christians, don't want to interact with gold, and they're happy that some race of creature cares about gold so they don't have to care about gold. Mm -hmm. However, it's important to remember, and this was always a really strange thing to me, that death when Death Eaters started rising to power, people feared that the goblins would join Voldemort, as did other oppressed beast folk, such as werewolves and giants. So like... Human, the regular human wizards also were big dicks to all these beasts. Like the beast taxonomy in the ministry was always really strange to me because I looked into this. So goblins were are you're either a uh, a man or a beast, and like centaurs were also beasts. And like let, we can also talk about all this weird centaur stuff. Centaurs chose to be beasts, though, according to the Fantastic Beast spinoff book, because ah. they didn't want to be lumped in with humans because they think humans are bad. So. Yeah. But like if your choice is go with the people who are oppressing you or the other people, mm -hmm. like that is the centaurs trying to deal with it. But like it's also very murky. Why did the ministry go with human or beast? Like what the fuck, guys? Yeah, wild. <laughs> so yeah, the Death Odors started rising to power. They were worried that the goblins would go over there. However, this did not happen because Voldemort murdered a goblin family near Nottingham, which led the goblins to just be neutral. Switzerland. <laughs> which is the whole thing at the end. The goblins were not helping... Their they were not helping anyone. They're like, oh, we got Nazis on one side and humans on the other side, the good guys. But we're going to stay neutral. <laughs> really odd. Um, I think that this was also reinforced by the fact that uh, Ludo Bagman screwed over the goblins. Apparently, goblins hold their debt to extremes. Another tick in the anti-Semitism box. Uh, remember, they hunted down Ludo Bagman after he lost a bet with them because he cheated them with leprechaun gold during the, uh, the World Cup. Um, the goblins then took everything of value from Ludo Bagman and hounded him because it was not enough to cover his debt. When Ludo uh, Bagman ran out of his final loss against the goblins, they refused to side with the humans against Voldemort because of him che because of him cheating. So because apparently in goblin logic, since Ludo Bagman was a tricky dick and he was a Philly, he worked at the Ministry of Magic. He, they held this debt to such an extreme against Voldemort, against H Wizard Hitler, that he's like, you know, the goblins are like, no, we're going to stay neutral, even though he murdered one of our families. Yeah, yeah, that's not good. I also don't like living in a world where Ludo Bagman is so important, but putting it that way, you've got a race of magical people that equate the worst racism prejudice out there possible that's equated with how much they care about money mm -hmm. and that's not a good look yeah i think it's also really strange these are just some final quick hits that i found and why i'm like jk rowling you spent a lot of time thinking about this the goblin rebellions that happened because goblins wanted wands and the humans wouldn't give it to them even though goblins can do magic without wands so fuck you guys can goblins do that too or is that just a house elf thing uh, apparently they can do mad although it's lower level obviously because with uh, wands are very important in the Harry Potter world. They can just do magic uh, even without them. Oh. Something that I learned. Okay. So even so, this race has something above humans, which I find also find kind of interesting. Uh, although they were depicted as bloody, like J.K. Rowling does this weird backpedaling thing where she says maybe... Uh, maybe the Ministry of Magic framed them as bloody because the humans were the ones doing lots of whack shit. There is someone named Yardley Platt who went around murdering goblins for no reason in the 15th and 16th centuries. Hey, 15th and 16th century Europe, what was happening then? Oh, pogroms and crusades. Is she doing this? She's doing this intentionally, Mike. Like, wh why write all of this unless you're really trying to frame it? Yeah, that that's what makes me the most upset about all this is that it's... Some people will try to say, oh, it's just based off of Tolkien's version of goblins. It's just the way goblins have always been written in fantasy. Right. She wasn't necessarily trying to do it intentionally. But when you look at all of the things and you line up all of the little details, there are too many things that could be viewed as a stereotype and something that appears to be anti-Semitic. There's too many things that line up for it to be completely incidental. Absolutely. I think that that's what it comes down to. Because not only he's saying, oh, that's just what we do in fantasy. Well, you should examine it because it wasn't great in fantasy before. And taking the genre of fantasy as just gospel is not good. But also, you went really out of your way to make goblins choose, my guy. <laughs> yeah, and that's the other thing. And I think that this is a good place to be at the end of this discussion is that 
going forward, just because something is done a certain way in fantasy does not mean that you have to keep doing it that way. Yes. Because goblins were like this in the past, it doesn't mean that goblins have to be that. I understand trying to make them look or act similar so that it goes with everyone's conceptual understanding of a goblin. But yeah. if you see something that exists and you're looking at it now and you say, ah, this might have some issues because you can point to this and point to that, you're allowed to change it. And it's something I've said on this show, when you have have the things where J.K. Rowling tries to root it in realism when people say, oh, the diversity at Hogwarts is actually really good compared to what the United Kingdom is. Yeah. You don't have to do that. Like, no one is telling you that you have to do things a certain way when you are making fantasy and you're creating this world. You can do whatever you want. It's your world. You don't have to follow any particular rules. So you don't have to make goblins look like goblins have always looked. You don't have to make the demographics of Hogwarts match the demographics of the United Kingdom in the late 90s. You can do whatever you want. And if you don't make the active choice to set things up in a way that doesn't look bad when you look at certain things under a bit of a microscope like we've done here, that's on you. That's your problem. And especially when these problems don't need a microscope like you have done here, it's just all out there and too many things point to it and it's a problem. Yeah. The whole point of working in genre, as I said in the beginning, was that it can be whatever you want it to be. Whether we're talking about fantasy, whether high fantasy or this urban fantasy that uh, Harry Potter is set in, or we're talking about sci-fi, or we're talking about superheroes, you can do whatever the fuck you want. And I also want to underscore, I, I did the whole thing in Act 2, like, this isn't just about Jews. Like, before everyone says, like, this is all sorts of minority groups. This, obviously, we've talked it extensively, both on the show and about so much in media, about the representation of black folk and fantasy racism, how, like, people with dark skin are inherently evil. Like, that's just in there, baked in there, 100%. We're talking about gay folk, we are also, and other uh, people who present uh, their gender identity, however it is. We're talking about Asians, uh, another thing that we didn't get a uh, chance to talk about was animal national nationalities in works of fiction that use animal races whether they're like humanoid animals or like animal animals like the Berenstein Bears for example like hey throw a panda in there boom Asian don't do that either that's bad this is happening all over the place but because this is something that I care about quite a lot and uh, something that I've been talking about on the show and in various different uh, places I really wanted to drill down on Jews I'm not saying this just happens on Jews I'm just focusing on anti-semitism and fantasy and the relationship between dwarves in J.R.R. Tolkien's work and uh, the goblins in Gringotts in Harry Potter. Yeah, it also makes sense because it's something that is a glaring issue in Harry Potter, which is what this podcast is about. You are Jewish, and I'm trying to do what more straight white people need to do, which is listen to other people and let them explain it rather than try to speak on behalf of them. So I'm glad that you have come here and let it be known exactly what the shortcomings of J.K. Rowling and her writing that very much looks like anti-Semitism, what all of that looks like in the books. Thank you for explaining it in a very thorough manner to where we now all fully get it, as opposed to just little five to 10 minute chunks every time you're on the show. Now we've got the whole thing where it's like, this is what he means. And if anyone now tries to email me or you about it, you could just link them this episode. You yeah, exactly. You don't have to reply anymore. It's like, actually, I did a bunch of research and I know specifically. <laughs> so I think it's worth going all the way back to Anthony Goldstein and to Wizard Christmas. Why does Wizard Christmas exist? There's no reason if you're at a school, you could just say you're having an end of the year feast, a winter break feast. It's still winter break. There's You have not reckoned with whether or not Jesus should exist in the magical world. And like you could have done this, but instead you decided to write about the goblin rebellions. And I don't know why. Right. And the problem isn't even so much so with just putting Wizard Christmas in the books. You could make the claim, like people have said, it's just a UK thing. They name the holidays, whatever. But when you go on Twitter and you say there are Jewish people at Hogwarts and you have explicitly not talked about them at all. Yeah. So now we have a problem. JK, like always, you could have said less, but you didn't. <laughs> Mike, I would love to leave you with one final image cool. about how this whole world is framed to pull back a little bit from goblins and the relationship between beasts and wizards. Mm -hmm. In the Order of the Phoenix, in the atrium of the Ministry of Magic, there is the Fountain of Magical Brethren. And uh, there is a house elf, a goblin, and a centaur are gazing up 
at a witch and a wizard. And if that is in your place of government, why the fuck would any beast who have been relegated to the fucking woods, to being your servants, and stuck doing your banking, why would anyone want to be your fucking friends? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And again, if you are trying to make the commentary that wizards have hubris for doing this, that is okay. But when you have very clearly made one of the lesser races, when that looks very much like Jewish people, Mm -hmm. now it's a problem. So you can make this cool commentary, which is interesting and would have been fine, but it's not a good look when one of these lesser races very much look like Jewish people. Now we have an issue, J.K. Rowling. And have the entire history of, you know, of Jewish people. Yeah, apparently. yeah. <laughs> we're, not even, we're, we're so far past looking like Jewish people when <laughs> goblins are. And, and, oh. when, when, I, when I say look, I do not mean physical. I mean appear, appear is what I probably should In have every said. sort but of still, facet. Yes, the point In holds. every <laughs> single facet, if they are Jewish people, it's fucking weird. <laughs> Well, Eric, thank you so much for doing this. You said you'd be posting an article about this. So if it is in the world when you are hearing this, it will be in the description of this podcast. If there is no link, it means it's not posted there yet, but I'm excited to see it when it ever comes live. Aside from that, is there anything else you would like to promote in this end of podcast time? Absolutely. Yes. That art, I'm very excited for that article to come out. It explores a lot of the similar things I said about Lord of the Rings, but then takes a hard left into Dungeons and Dragons. Well, instead, I took a, the leisurely right into Harry Potter and the various works of J.K. Rowling. <laughs> You can also find me as the Dungeon Master on Join the Party, uh, which is a wonderful uh, Dungeons & Dragons game that uh, we've kind of ripped off the genre of high fantasy for the second campaign, and we're doing like a modern superhero uh, X-Men sort of thing right now that you can hop into. We're in the middle of it, and uh, we're like 20 episodes in, I think you really enjoy it. Yeah, go listen to the other shows on Multitude. We're all, all of them are good. They're all good. Agreed. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thanks for listening. And as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, before they wonder why only one type of people are allowed to get jobs in banking, wizard on. Schmeckle on. <laughs> Hey, it's the new year. You just spent a bunch of time and money and effort giving gifts over the holidays, presumably. But you know what? Why don't you do a little something for yourself? You're a month into your New Year's resolutions and you're doing a great job. So why don't you reward yourself with some Multitude merch? If you go to multitude.production slash merch, you can get all sorts of things from shirts to hats to pins to digital wallpapers to ringtones for all of the Multitude shows. And again, that lives at multitude.production slash merch. Pottery List was created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Christine Aaron Johnson, Klaus Lopu, Marchis, Juan Sanfili, Rosemary, Dosh, Marie, Lisa C. Keen, Audra, Elnor, Curlin, Nikita Power, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Alex Consulver, John Cocker, Noel Basile, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Marklu, Justin Montero, Jacob Parrish, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Zena Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Nikki Harris, Kine, Amida Alfor, Kafir Shaltiel, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morris, and Maya, Flor Sake, Georgia Davis, Skyla Lily, Adele Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskov Chova, Michael David Yordi, Kelly Otilio, Kerry Crumpler, Connie Bean, Kowski, Jen Went, Nedry OS, Will Huser, Marco Cepeda, Marik Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Fail on the Meadows Family, Ginny from the Block, Heather Langeal, Kevin Stewart, Jarl, Sviven, Pita McGrath, Jen and Rose Daub, Callahan and Deras, Leah Reed, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Becca Spry, Reese Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Lily's Mom, Madison, Don't Call Me Nymphadora, Sabrina Bossiger, Sophia Loves Pigs, Farzan Jarabat, Melanie DeGrave, Matt Barger, Okamahime, Boney Pony, Kelsey Gillespie, Rike Mangor Jensen, Taylor Payne, Megan Moon, Riley Kidas, Laurel Happy, Erica Butler, Miranda, Landon Schwausch, Kendra Hertz, Natanya Page, Yogan Shanley, Darcy Alex. Alexandra Harrison, Sandra Rose, Craig McRoberts, Lior Nachum, Demi Lynn, Michelle Spurgeon, Calista Delano, Jennifer Terzian, Henrika Wolf, Delkis, Katrina Smith, Casey Canales, Megan Stempen, Zot, Jack Gitzes, Sophia Leone, Dane Nemcher, Robin Garcia, Chick Parm, Mermaid and her Daddykins, Ilaria Vicentin, Gregory Hughes, The Real Stan Chunpei, Call Call Mother Feathers, Nina Jazalik, Ribbon Monstrosity, Brittany Harper, Ashley Somers, Gavin Miller, Jack Parr, Serenity Allen, Emily Quinlan, Haley Hastings, Sabrina Casanova, Jenny Browers, Laurel, Mazatov Hila, Eileen Gazesh, Annette Pipitone, Kirsten R. Cunningham, Hufflepuff alumni, Brett Clausen, Hunter Gordon, Gordon, Mary Price, Artemis, Trans People or People, Samantha McNamara, Nina Campley, Tatiana Schmitova, Taylor Roberts, Karis Davies, Little Vomit Spiders Running Around, Tony Joe McHufflepuff, Punkfish, Rochelle Mobs, Wire Warrior, Catherine Carolchak, Joe Sanders, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Web design by Kelly Schubert, and the music is by Bettina Kambamanas. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, and reddit.com slash r slash potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com, bonus content, 
lives at patreon.com slash Potterless, and merch lives at potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. If you want to tell someone about the show, let them know about it. Reach out to someone that you think would love the show and just say, hey, there's a show called Potterless. It's great. You'll enjoy it. Here's a link. Or you could leave a review online. Those also help as well. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on. Wizard on.